Good Stewardship for Fire. This is um, shared with us today by Matthew Thompson and Chris Dunn. And um, let's just get that organized here. Um, Matt Thompson is a research forester with the Human Dimensions Program of the Rocky Mountain Research Station USDA Forest Service. His research interests include risk and decision analysis, systems thinking, operations research and analytics, wildfire management, and forest management. His current focus is addressing COVID-19 impacts on the health and capacity of the wildland firefighting community. In 2016, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Dr. Christopher Dunn is a research associate in the College of Forestry at Oregon State University. He spent eight years in fire suppression and fuels management prior to pursuing research on fire effects and ecosystem response to mixed severity fires. Um, now he leverages his operational experience and research training to bridge the gap between science and management in an effort to better prepare land and fire managers for the changing fire environment. His research now focuses on the safety and effectiveness of large fire management, supported by collaborations with the Human Dimensions Program at the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Matt and Chris, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks Annie. And thanks Tony and Emily Jane, that really teed us up uh, pretty well. Uh, beginning with this idea of, of shared stewardship for fire going back to Tony's point about um, concepts of, you know, the, the, the scope and scale of the challenge exceeding any, any one entity's capability. Um, one of the concepts we've been using is this idea that, you know, fire knows no boundaries and neither do fire control opportunities, um, which uh, leads, in my mind anyway, directly to, to one of their points, which is this idea of shared risk, shared responsibility, shared investment, or, um, Shared stewardship, if you will. So the emphasis here is really on cross-boundary collaborative fire planning, uh, largely using the idea of pods that, that Tony alluded to. Um, and I think they rightly, and, and I appreciate it, kind of described it as both an activity and an object. And there's a good quote from Dwight Eisenhower back uh, from years ago. And uh, simply put, it says, plans are nothing, planning is everything which isn't to degrade the value of the product or especially when it becomes a boundary spending object. Um, but the, the idea of getting the right people at the table, having the right conversations, framing the problem correctly, getting the right type of input, I think is really pretty critically important. So uh, before I jump into it, just want to acknowledge there's a whole lot of folks who have been, been working on this, including, uh, for example, Mike Caggiano and, and Ben Gannon from Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, a lot of folks from Forest Service, Colorado State, Nature Conservancy, uh, Chris, uh, who I've known since uh, when I still had hair, um, and he's been a great colleague. Let me move ahead here. Okay, if you leave this with just a couple of take home points, um, one, it is about the basic risk management problem or the basic risk management concept rather of buy yourself, buy yourself time and advance of decisions you're likely to face down the road, especially if those decisions like wildfire are kind of characterized by time pressures. So it's engage the fire before it starts. In a, in a planning concept or in a planning construct rather that is proactive, anticipatory, cross-boundary and collaborative. And I will say admittedly, this, this whole pod idea kind of started as a forest service centric model. We worked uh, almost exclusively with agency fire management officers and line officers. And it's been a learning curve to um, do what exactly Tony and Emily Jane just described, which is bring in additional organizations, have it truly be a boundary spanning both activity and object. Even today, we have uh, during pod workshops, uh, in some cases, some reticence uh, to draw that boundary, anything other than an administrative boundary. And we're finding that in in areas or in context where there already is that pre-existing relationship with your with your you know cross jurisdictional neighbors, that 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 idea of drawing the line across boundaries becomes easier. Uh, we try and infuse this with best practices, uh, co-management, institutionalizing the knowledge of local experts, um, infusing planning with analytics and, and communication. And on the ground is is really what what Chris can really speak to. Uh, far more intelligently than I can in terms of how to operationalize this uh, to support land and fire management decisions, 
to ideally improve outcomes and, and to enhance these partnerships so that this becomes an iterative process of improvement. So in terms of how I conceive of this, uh, it's really kind of part of this risk management cycle. Again, we talked about shared risks and shared responsibilities. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, really this kind of stylized risk management cycle begins with planning into execution, monitoring and feedback, and that is an iterative process. And so really, I think what we're focused on here is really the planning and execution side and the monitoring component of how does this cross boundary uh, collaborative planning work is an ongoing effort uh, with Courtney Schultz and her colleagues at Colorado State doing some third party reviews and we we hope that that process of monitoring and feedback will inform how we go about engaging in planning and execution moving forward. So the big why is to support safe and effective wildfire response by facilitating co-management of risk, which we hope will kind of expand both the decision space and the decision time, uh, facilitate these pre-season engagements and coordination across boundaries, and ultimately in terms of that object as well as activity, it's, it's delivered decision support that is operationally relevant. And again, uh, pods, so potential fire operational delineations. Um, the, the basic idea is to pre-identify on the landscape potential control lines with the highest likelihood of success, going back to that concept that neither fire nor fire control opportunities necessarily respect or acknowledge jurisdictional boundaries. By drawing these effectively fire management units, fire management polygons, you can then use them uh, as a map tool to summarize wildfire risk, to summarize operational opportunities and challenges, to use that information to be more strategic in what your response might be. Uh, and again, it facilitates this idea of cross-boundary planning, communication, prioritization of where you want to intervene on the landscape. And what you see on the left there is a map of the Tonto National Forest, one of the early adopters um, that kind of embrace this and they have uh, now several fire seasons worth of experience in, in leveraging the pods concept, not only as a planning tool, but in execution as well. And so this specifically is the 2017 Pinal fire that we're zoomed in on. And admittedly, we kind of cherry pick this example because it tells the narrative that we want to tell a little bit, but the final footprint of the fire almost identically matches that pre-identified uh, pod boundary because conditions were such that they were able to manage it. Compare that right now, for example, with fires we're seeing in Colorado where uh, extreme fire behavior is, is leading to fires that are crossing pod boundaries, but there's still some value in identifying those features, for example, for some pretty active burnout operations. So I will briefly go into the how, and Chris can provide a little bit more detail, but it's this idea of blending uh, both local expertise, expertise with some kind of fire behavior analytics. So we have workshops, which admittedly are more challenging now in this virtual environment, but it's getting people to talk, reflect, deliberate, what do they know about the landscape, what has worked and hasn't worked in the past, where might those most viable control opportunities be, and that can be informed and you can use it as a kind of a pro and con argument, is this really a good control feature by using predictive models based on analysis of historical fire perimeters, where have fires likely, uh, where are fires more likely to stop based on features like built features, natural features, distance to roads, slope topography, et cetera. And then you get into this idea of physical cross boundary. So this concept again, that control opportunities don't know boundaries. And so you draw these, these control lines irrespective of ownership and jurisdictional boundaries. On the bottom left there, it's kind of hard to see maybe, but there's this rectilinear line that is an administrative boundary of a national forest. And you can see that the fire behavior analytics would show that there's no real alignment between that rectilinear feature and what the landscape might actually afford. And, and then on the right, the broader map, this was made by Mike Caggiano, shows what's happened here in Northern Colorado. I also like Tony and Fort Collins with the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest. That very glaring donut hole is Rocky Mountain National Park. And through the process of the forest engaging with this and also engaging with the park in their kind of annual training exercises, we have since this map was generated, worked with Rocky Mountain National Park to fill in that gap. And they now have drawn pods on their landscape that is, it was truly kind of that cross boundary planning. And then the other aspect of course is the social cross boundary. So you wanna foster this communication and consultation with 
the appropriate external and internal stakeholders to integrate land and fire management concerns with local community concerns. And, and in the ideal, that develops this kind of shared expectation, this shared understanding, which, you know, in the ideal leads to shared stewardship. So some quick plugs in terms of where we've been and where we're headed. We're increasingly trying to increase the, the user friendliness, if you will, of pods as a planning tool. So this is some work that Mike Caggiano and Ben Gannon have really been spearheading, which is using pods, pod atlases as a quick way to summarize a lot of the information on values at risk, on potential fire behavior, on control locations, not only along pod boundaries, but summarized within a pod. And we think there's some value there and kind of rapidly available information to support decision making. And pods as a decision support tool, so not only in the planning phase, but in the actual operational phase, uh, many forests have uploaded their pods into the wildland fire decision support system. And we're oftentimes seeing uh, as kind of looking over people's shoulders how they're using pods within WIFTIS. And we're hoping that there's actually some ongoing work with next generation WIFTIS being built. And we, we think that bringing in some of these pod atlas ideas in, into how that tool is built could be fruitful. And again, that execution thing is really about translating plans into actions. This is the exact same fire that I showed on an earlier slide, just with more specifics. So you can see that even on a fire that was managed for resource benefit, it, it wasn't uh, independent of protection concerns. So on, on one uh, flank of this perimeter, they had to do a lot of point protection, but they did it in such a way that they still felt like they could manage the fire and they conducted the burnout operations along the road and kind of what we're referring to as a curated fire. Now, of course, this can't happen everywhere. There may be, especially like Tony said, with this fire season, uh, much more emphasis on full suppression, but that doesn't mean that these sort of features and strategic planning can't still help for safe and effective decisions around where and when to send people and under what conditions. So we will now see if this works. We created a series of whiteboard videos. There's three of them on YouTube. It kind of walks through the, the, the origins of the idea of fires not knowing control features either when they cross boundaries. And it identifies some of the planning tools that we've built, which Chris will go into in much more detail. Uh, thank you, Michelle. I think we will just move forward since this isn't working, but it's Kit O'Connor's smooth voice that's narrating over this pretty cool uh, whiteboard style. For those who know the Wiree program, um, they've similarly done these whiteboard videos, and that's where we got the idea, actually. Uh, so, summary, um, we think that there are some benefits here, opportunities to engender stronger cross-jurisdictional communication and accountability in, in both planning and, and response activities. Um, encourages transparency, you know, that idea that Emily Jane mentioned of you need trust there uh, with partners, um, having that pre-season dialogue and familiarity with these risk management tools which we hope are you know, incrementally improving over time, both in terms of kind of the, the scientific basis, but also the social basis, who's using them, how, why, and what, and what feedback are they giving us in terms of their actual user need. Um, challenges, uh, capacity, some of these workshops can be time and resource intensive, especially on the preparation side. And then once you have these objects, um, they need to be maintained over time in response to changes on the landscape, et cetera. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all approach, which requires some flexibility and, and adaptability and, and really tailoring it to the conditions of not only the landscape, but that kind of social cross-boundary organizational context. Um, so I think with that, I will uh, segue over to, to Chris Dunn. Um, and just a quick plug, uh, like in the introduction, you know, Chris has, has multiple years of, of actual Fireline experience, so his ability to kind of think in terms of how these tools can be operationalized and put onto the ground is really valuable. And he has also been working uh, pretty comprehensively and exhaustively in the Pacific Northwest, where this is not only a federal tool now, he's been working with state departments and local communities and, and really uh, translate these concepts into action. So with that, take it away, Chris. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, let me see if I can advance these slides okay. Uh, you know, really what I want to try to demonstrate is some of the power of having these analytics and, and, and how it can inform um, some of what we're talking about with, with mitigating wildfire risk at, at multiple scales. And so 
I'm gonna I'm gonna provide a bunch of examples and maps primarily of how how these these different analytics can really inform um, those decisions. And I, and I want to begin with at this broader regional scale. And this was a, a, a an analysis done by Joe Scott and, and Rick Stratton specifically, really driving towards that that fire shed concept and delineating those fire shed concepts. Uh, what you see specific here is um, a burn probability map for the region that was created. Uh, using the, the hazard component of the quantitative wildfire risk assessment that was done across all lands here in Region 6, uh, completed in 2017, so er early part of 2017. Um, and then it's overlaid on the, the graph on the right with, so the burn probability across the x-axis and then the number of housing units um, on the y-axis. And what you can see is a, is a frontier out here of communities that are at uh, have a high probability of experiencing a fire and then uh, stratified by the, the number of housing units present there. And this can really help inform and prioritize the, the communities you may engage with up front um, based on this risk profile. And similarly, you can take this, this same data and um, extract, sorry, it took a second to, to switch there, and, and really extract the, the spatial location of, of where that risk is generated from, the source of that risk, and you can see that in this map here on the left, and so uh, the, the darker blue would be that there are, is a, a larger number of ignitions that in that simulation process that, can exp, ex, that it, uh, exposes those communities to, um, to wildfire, in the sense, and you can see really then and delineate that fire shed around a community much of which is, some of which is on public lands here, you can see in the Forest Service hash marks and others that are on private lands, and that can really help delineate that, that source of risk, and then um, within that start to, to look at who needs to come to the table in that shared responsibility construct to um, unravel that risk and really protect those communities. And so this is really a regional scale. We can further modify this um, at, my, I'd say, a state scale. And in this case, really, um, my interest was was downscaling it to the state and looking at it from a um, social vulnerability index. So really, now now we have this you know these some of these communities that have a high number of housing units um, may not be the most vulnerable communities uh, across say the state of Oregon. And so what I what I did here and and this was working with uh, the governor's wildfire council here in Oregon, what was create a map that you can see here on the right that. Um, categorizes voting blocks in this case based on um, these overall vulnerability index from the, the Centers for Disease Control. And this comes out of um, the, the surveys, the American, what is it, the American Community Survey data set that is sent out and, and, and they try to quantify much of this information. And when you have a, a, a hazard analysis or some, some, you know, which is the simulated fire behavior and risk portion from, uh, the quantitative risk assessment, you can make an adjustments to this, these types of maps uh, based on the actual fire hazard. Trying to get the slide to change here and we can, we can further then diversify the landscape based on these voting blocks, um, based on both their vulnerability and their probability of experiencing a, a fire. And you can see how then it stratifies. And this can help further inform how you might allocate resources to, to um, various communities across, in this case, the state level. So both their probability of experiencing a fire and the vulnerability of those communities to said fire and their ability to recover based on the factors that you see here. Now, uh, continuing on here, looking more at the, the broader perspective of the pod process. So now we've got a geographic location of interest um, in this case, we're looking at the Stanislaus National Forest boundary that you see in front of us with a delineated seral project area. So this was a, a project area that has been delineated by the local collaborative group as a priority landscape for uh, restoration. And what we have done is brought in a bunch of analytics to help support uh, their decision processes. They try to unravel the risks that um, is present on this landscape. And here on the left, you see the potential control location map uh, that has been discussed, um, and this in, com in combination with the suppression difficulty index map, like a, a, a response function assessment. So how do they respond to various intensities of wildfire 
uh, to get to this conditional net value change. If a fire happens, what is the cumulative effects expected from, from doing so? And in this case, I extended it on to expected net value change as well, which is the multiplication of the two maps on the left uh, to look at and rather than just if a fire happens, what are the expected outcomes, but the likelihood and outcomes from said fire. And you can see how that distributes across uh, the Stanislaus National Forest in this case, as well as this local seral project that is intended to protect the wild, so some wildland urban interface issues and, and other spotted owl and um, valued resource impacts, uh, including drinking water and power supplies. And you can see that play out a little bit more uh, in this map. And so now we're summarizing to those pods. Now that we have pods delineated by fire staff that uh, give some certainty that they could contain or control a fire at those boundaries under typical conditions during the fire season. Uh, we can summarize risk. In this case, what's the risk profile internally of that pod? What is the risk profile of all the ignitions that occurred within said pod and then potentially spread outside of those pods? So this is what we call the source risk. And it gets at that potential for these lines, these pod boundaries to be breached. And then you can uh, combine these two, as you see at the top, to develop those strategic response zones, which Matt, Matt demonstrated uh, for the Tonto National Forest. And so this was just completed a couple weeks ago for the Stanislaus National Forest. And now we have addressed one of the most dominant um, mitigation actions uh, that will be necessary to unravel risk over the long term, and that is using wildfire uh, for resource objectives and benefits. And so the green areas would be that, that fire, sh the, the default strategy should be to manage that fire to a greater degree for, for the benefit of the landscape and the resources across this particular landscape. The yellow area is really those under the right conditions, you could probably use fire, um, but the conditions must be right. Um, and so you can see how that stratifies. And then the red, of course, is aggressive suppression the, the valued resources and assets on that site are such that, that um, wildfire impacts are, are too great to promote any sort of resource objective fire, uh, exclusive of prescribed burning in the shoulder seasons. So now we stratified this landscape and you can see where this cell project really sits is in one of those really red zones where uh, wildfire won't be used for, for resource objectives and therefore we need to look to other strategies to mitigate the risk within that landscape. And these tools can also help inform that. So I wanted to give you a, a Google Earth image of that landscape and what we're looking at here. So you can see a lot of communities that border this landscape area, um, obviously uh, less managed than it is to the north within this area uh, uh, because of the both the valued resources in there, the spotted owl habitat that's present in there, the recreational opportunities in these communities are facts, as well as you can see power lines that, that string off of uh, this um, reservoir here. And so there's a lot of power generation, water issues, and, and others. And so that's why this landscape was really uh, uh, selected as, as a need. And they've, they've come up with some fuel breaks. I'm going to show you a, a little better depiction of how that plays out um, with, with some of our risk, risk analytics in the next image here. And so this is that conditional net value change. So this is an assessment. If a fire happens, what is your likely uh, positive or negative consequences. And in this case, here's that sterile landscape is in the slightly darker line here, and then the pod network that's overlaid behind it. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of risk um, within this landscape as we depicted in those broader um, force-wide maps. And they've, they've come up with um, a strategy then, if this is a full protect, how do we support our fire management organizations uh, to, to better suppress fire as needed as we begin to implement restoration treatments and more prescribed burning. And they, they have these fuel break networks and you, what you can see is that they're, they're leveraging the, many of these pod boundaries to um, as fuel break networks where they need to implement a bunch of treatments to help support that effort so that we can protect all the communities that align here, protect the power supply that comes out of here and the water, the water supply, um, which are, are clearly and obviously important to the, the state of California and beyond. And, and so this is how they've done it and how pods then can help inform that. And so further downscaling and moving on, when you have these tools and we have all of those maps that I just depicted, uh, we can see, you can, you can look at landscapes now 
in a different perspective, from the perspective of how fire managers view the landscape. And that's really key because what we're trying to do is mitigate fire. And so if we understand how firefighters and fire management organizations view landscapes, we can then align and address uh, their needs to a greater extent. And you can see in a broad context, a lot of values at risk and, and then you know low opportunities to contain a fire, really difficult suppression landscape, and lo and behold, we've gotten large fires, as you can see in this big boundary here. Uh, that, that transpire in that landscape. So you can see those and you can begin to allocate your, your uh, uh, mitigation actions accordingly. Uh, similarly, you can look at just adjacent to a community and jurisdictional boundaries and you can see some hotspots. Um, in this case, Ashland, Oregon and Southwest Oregon, you can see some hotspots on, uh, on private land as well as public land um, and, and then figure out who you need to work with in that shared responsibility context to to uh, ensure that a fire does not transmit out of the watershed and into the community. And then similarly, we can see that um, more broadly, now looking at Grants Pass in a, a multi-ownership, multi-jurisdictional landscape. So this shaded area is, is really um, private lands, forest service lands up here by the top corner, and then it's BLM intermixed. And so we have this multi-jurisdictional land. Uh, you can see where you're likely to catch a fire should it happen, um, a large fire happen which will be down here in the Valley Bottoms, right adjacent to a community. And therefore, who needs to come to the table? You can begin to, to identify who those are, where they are, and, and what type of actions need to occur to really address uh, that potential for the community to be impacted negatively by wildfire. And so this, that's just the last one, but instead of my own words giving you the conclusions, I wanted to just bring out some, some quotes from this uh, document that was re recently com completed. Um, by Oregon State Fire Marshals. And as you can see, they have um, some of this, they've come to some of the same conclusions of the efforts that um, both Tony and EJ were talking about and Matt and I are talking about here in, in, in a direction forward to begin to unravel uh, some of the problems and challenges we are faced with. Uh, particularly that there should be data-driven and knowledge-based strategy, which the pods process and these objects that, that are produced from that uh, and uh, integrate and inform, um, and it should be supported or planned and supported at a broader level, but implemented locally through uh, various means. And I'll stop there, and Matt and I will take any questions.